Hey guys, welcome back to Embers and Ash. My name's Ashley, if you didn't know. Today we're talking about preparing for the baby. Um, I am 17 weeks pregnant. That blows my mind. Like, I'm almost halfway through. I'm also coming down from a cold, so if at any point you're confused about the sound of my voice, that's that. I got a little iced coffee to give me a boost of energy. It's actually an iced latte, which I kind of wish I did an iced coffee because it's a lot of milk. But anyways, let's talk about the things that I'm doing the same this time around with the baby. So like parenting techniques. So I've already made a video on all my regrets in the newborn phase. Uh, so check that one out if you want to hear what I'm going to do differently. But there's a lot of things that I really liked that I did, um, the way they worked for Rook. Of course, not every baby's the same. This child might not react well to these parenting techniques, but I'm gonna try them out because again, they were successful and I'm hoping to have a smooth transition into the newborn phase and onwards. This isn't just newborn stuff. The first thing that I'm gonna do the same is not hold the baby all the time. You guys have heard me talk about this and how I'm back and forth about, you know, you shouldn't never hold your baby. Like, you only have a newborn for so long, you should definitely, like, get those cuddles in. But my worst fear last time was having a child that would only be happy being held. And for some parents, like, they're happy with that. It's like, their preference, whatever. For me, I wanted a bit more independence, so I really pr tried to prioritize having the baby on the ground a lot. Um, I don't know how realistic that is with a toddler running around, but at least like a safe space to put the toddler to put the baby down, um, because I want to make sure that they can be chill on their own and sleep on their own and not always have to be held for naps, etc. Speaking of which, I want to prioritize that the baby sleeps more on their own than on me. Again, the best feeling in the world as a new mom is having your child sleep on your chest. It's so good for you, it's so good for your baby, great bonding. I'm not saying don't do that, but I wanted to make sure that more than 50% of the time the baby is sleeping on their own so that they, they know how to do that and they don't get accustomed to just sleeping on my chest because it is obviously really nice having like the heartbeat and you know being close to mom um, but I just again need some more independence than always having the baby on my chest um, so last time I think I was a little too picky about this and I feel like I could be a little more lenient but I still want to stay true to most naps are alone because your baby takes so many naps like a newborn takes so many naps even if only half of them are on your chest that's still a lot of skin on skin time the third thing i'm doing the same is limiting baby holding devices that prevent their movement i don't really know if this makes a big difference or not but I remember learning about it, so I'm like, might as well. Um, you want your child to be able to kind of squirm around and learn how to move and not always be like tight in like a carrier or a swing or, you know, the car seat. You want to make sure they have like that time to be free and flexible. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, try and prioritize that again. It's supposedly good for them. I don't remember all the research. The fourth thing that I'm doing, which is a little controversial, as with most things in parenthood, uh, is sleep training. When the baby's ready, I'm sleep training that baby. And I, I know not every baby can be sleep trained. And you guys know we do a gentle sleep training approach. I think you know that. If you didn't, there you go. Um, it's just, for me and my family, we prioritize our sleep and I can be my best version of a mom when I'm getting a normal amount of sleep, you know? So as soon as the baby's ready for that, usually three months old, um, we're gonna jump on it. Again, I'm not pressuring everyone to do it. It really is up to the parents whether it's right for them, but I know that for me, it was great. <laughs> the fifth thing I did was the best, and that was no sleep schedule until the kids, like, I think 
I think when Rook went down to like two naps a day, that's when we did a schedule because it's kind of hard to not have a schedule when they're only taking two naps. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just went off of wake windows. So whatever time Rook would wake up in the morning, we would start that time slot and then put them down when they're supposed to go to sleep. But it was never like a 7, 11, 3 kind of thing. Um, and that was really nice because it left life a lot more flexible, especially when your child's taking a lot of naps. It's okay if some of them aren't perfect, like if one of them's a car nap, if one of them is, you know, being held and then is shorter than usual. I didn't feel a lot of pressure to make every nap perfect because they can catch up in the next nap. Now, on a one nap schedule, that nap better be good because we only get one and I can't deal with an overtired toddler. <laughs> oh, the next technique I'm gonna be doing again is where you make sure that naps are done in bright environments and nighttime sleep is done in a dark environment. I know, you know, people will swear by blackout curtains, whatever, if you wanna do that, cool. I like having a child who can sleep in daylight. Like, I never close Rook's blinds. Um, you know, we turn the light off, but, um, yeah, I just like to know that if I just need him to take a nap somewhere, he can take it and I don't have to worry about it being too bright. With, like, you know, there's a limit to that. But um, the other thing specifically why this is important is because it helps your child learn when to take short naps and when to do a long sleep. So when you're leaving the environment bright during the day for those naps, it helps teach them like, oh, these are supposed to be short little cat naps. And then at nighttime, it's dark, it's quiet. Um, that's supposed to teach them that it's time to do a long sleep. And it, it's supposed to help them with um, getting out of the nocturnal cycle that they usually have when they come out of the womb. So um, yeah, I'm gonna try that again. The next technique I'm gonna be doing again is the dream feed. That is where, um, you know, you put, you put your child down to sleep at six, seven, eight, whatever it is. And a couple hours later, you wake them up to feed them or they'll wake up on their own. But either way, making sure they're getting a feed at like 10 p.m., 11 p.m. And that can really help them stretch their, their like overnight sleep longer because they have that full belly as opposed to if they're going down at 7 p.m. and not waking up for another feed, they might wake up at 3 a.m., which is not ideal. But if while you're still awake at 11 p.m., which, you know, maybe we're not supposed to be, but I know I am, <laughs> um, if you get a, one last feed in there, you might stretch their sleep till 6 a.m., you know, ideally, and not right away. Kids take a while to, you know, sleep through the night. But I just remember that being really helpful, and then eventually you can transition off of it once you figure they don't need it anymore. Uh, but it's, it was just a helpful tool. The next thing I'm excited for is um, taking the baby out with no pressure on schedules or, um, you know, nap times, that kind of thing. It's, it was so easy, and I didn't realize how easy it was, but it was so easy, relatively, to take out a three-month-old because they're just a blob, and they're like, they'll go anywhere with you. Um, and if, again, they have a bad nap, they'll catch up later. But now, with a child on the one-nap schedule, it's like, okay, we have to be home by 12 so that we get that nap in. And so while I have... The little one who's super flexible, I want to make sure I get out and take advantage of it because I know there's going to be a time period, I've talked to another mom friend about this, it sounds horrible, <laughs> where your oldest is taking one nap a day at 12 and your, your younger one, like six to nine months or whatever it is, they're taking two naps a day on opposing schedules. So your whole day, one of the kid is napping, so if you want them to have good naps, you have to stay home all day. That's gonna be a really rough three months. I'm not looking forward to it. I'm sure I'll compromise on naps here and there, but while the child is still flexible <laughs> with their nap schedule, I'm gonna get out of the house. And yeah, I guess those are those are all the notes I wrote down. Those are all the things I'm gonna try and do the same. Um, again, every child's different, and I'm really praying that I have a child similar to Rook because he was such a joy. Um, 
but you never know, <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get. And sometimes it feels like, you know, I, I deserve to have a rough child because <laughs> Rook was so good. But anyways, uh, I hope this video is helpful for you guys if you're expecting your first child, your second, etc. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.